Uh, let me start by uh, first expressing my uh, sincere gratitude to uh, those who developed this uh, ill-conceived plan to have me speak <laughs> at this meeting of, uh, of AB10, Dr. Kevin Rogers and your accomplices. Um, I, I appreciate the risk you have taken and uh, thank you. Thank you immensely for the anxieties you bring into my life. <laughs> So don't hang around those folks if you have issues with anxiety, okay? But I must also acknowledge my, my mentors, my colleagues and friends from Cape Town Baptist Seminary. In, in many ways, you, you gentlemen um, are, um, or I am at least, an example of what I'm being asked to present here, and that is theological institutions doing missions. And uh, I, I don't believe that I would have taken the steps with my family and taken the risks with my family if I had not first seen them uh, among you. And so I want to thank you each for bearing in, in, in your bodies the sufferings that are lacking in Christ's. I've seen you, by the grace of God, lay down your lives so that others may, may take up life in Christ Jesus and I am immensely grateful for each of you, and I couldn't allow an opportunity like this to go a begging without honoring you in public for the role that you have played um, in what's happening in my life. Uh, whether I'm anxious about it or not, that doesn't matter. I'm grateful nonetheless. Much of what I have to share here with you today has already been touched on in various aspects. Um, and uh, in my endeavor to help us consider some missional praxis for institutions, I, like those who have come before me, also thought it wise to start our approach um, with a reflection from a brief history of theological education. That seems to me to have been a theme um, among many of the speakers, particularly if we are looking to uh, build on what has happened historically as we traject a uh, pathway forward. The history of theological education is something I'm going to refer to for different reasons, though. We do want to, like we are advised by uh, Gonzalez and Rodin and all of the rest of those who have attempted this, um, that, uh, that this is something that is necessary um, as we consider uh, the history of theological education, at least for a few grounds. It has value in our pursuit after a theological education as missional practice by allowing greater awareness and appreciation for how theological education has uh, evolved over time. And importantly, the factors that have influenced its development. And this in turn, I'm hoping, may facilitate the identification of patterns and trends that assist in critically evaluating theological education philosophies, methodologies, and praxis, uh, both past and present toward a more intentional uh, missional praxis for theological education of the future. And so I'm going to start where everyone else has, and that's uh, with, the, with the early church. And I'm just, if I may, going to highlight a few of the aspects um, that relate to, relate to theological education within, within, the, within the early church. Jack Jackson argues that Christian theological education was um, by the, the transmission by new Christian converts. The seminary education for the first disciples uh, included personal interaction with the Lord over a period of three years. And uh, subsequently, new con converts would sit under the teaching of these trained in person by Christ. And so you can see that much of the theological training that they received was something that transpired very much in person as life was happening. And so much so that it uh, had an almost intrusive contact with the individual providing the theological training. You will notice then that as we move uh, a little further from the early church, 
you will see a distance being created between this, what we would describe as costly discipleship, this almost intrusive contact with those who are being discipled for Christian leadership um, away um, as we move away from, from, from the early church. Now, this lack of formality in the early church, this lack of formal education, or what we have come to know as formal education, should not be read as being devoid of cognitive and academic rigor. Uh, regarding those discipled by Christ as purely practical ministry expertise, in my view, would be a mistake. I think any superficial reading of the New Testament would lead us to conclude that the individuals described there and certainly those who have contributed to the New Testament show an argumentative and rhetorical prowess second to none in our day and in our time. I do not buy the sentiment that what was happening in New Testament times was purely practical theological training, I would argue that it had academic or cognitive rigor in its time. Yes, Jesus may have found the disciples and they may have been described as unlearned in that they have not been subjected to some of the formal requirements of tuition in the day and in the time. But I would argue Jesus didn't leave them unlearned. They were instead highly qualified and could go toe to toe with the best of us. Even a Christian woman in that time could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of them, as is described by Priscilla and Aquila's engagement with Apollos. Here we see an example of argumentation, rigorous debate, and persuasion taking place, which I think is something that requires some cognitive acumen. If you look at Luke, I'm sure you will agree with me that this is one of the best representations of a, uh, the, a, 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 a historical work that you will likely see in, in, in antiquity. There's probably not going to be an example from antiquity that rivals what Luke was able to do in his orderly account of what had transpired in the Gospel of Luke. And then following that up with the Acts of the Apostles that is just expertly written and that even historians to this day, secular historians to this day, regard as a vital work for understanding the life and times with, uh, within the, the early church. We are still studying the works of Paul, and even Peter says that he speaks dark sayings, and I would suggest that, uh, that such an engagement or such a work or such prowess from the apostle suggests that there was in that day and in that time um, at least academic and at least cognitive rigor um, that, uh, that can contest some of what we would describe as our most rigorous academic institutions in our day. Stephen could not be resisted in his argumentation and they had to kill him. There was no winning an argument with this man. He was so empowered by the Holy Spirit and so capable of uh, presenting the gospel and arguing for Christ as, as Lord and as Savior, the Messiah that should come, that the only alternative was to kill the man. And even Christ, our Lord and our Savior, said to us that we must love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. And so I resist the notion that the early church was purely practical in its outlook um, and do not view it as a valid argument for purely practical training as we traject a future for uh, missiological praxis. Um, for us as institutions. It is, in my view, not the way forward. The need then for more formal training seems to have been borne in on the church during the course of the second century based on the growing self-consciousness of a church locked in debate with pagans and Jews on the one hand and heretical schools of Gnostics on the other, undoubtedly calling for systematic and concentrated mental discipline, 
on the part of those who would undertake leadership. And an example of this would be the Catechetical School of Alexandria, founded by Bishop Demetrius, where uh, Oregon eventually assumed leadership before leaving for Caesarea. Um, and, and this, I would argue, is, is a prime example. To assume, then, that this move towards a more catechetical school where there are more defined disciplines of academic rigor, that it lacked anything of a practical nature and that there was a pendulum swing from uh, what would be this informal training all the way to a more formalized uh, methodology would also be a mistake. Oregon is claimed to have transformed his disciples still more by his personal influence than by his scholarship. He was not a lecturer who merely appeared from time to time before an audience. He was a master and tutor who lived constantly with his disciples. Again, you see the trend continue of what is this costly discipleship of those who are going to engage in academic academic activities, academic rigorous, academic uh, learning as well. So in brief then, the, the medieval and middle ages, for reasons that go beyond the scope of our inquiry, began to seek refuge in monasteries and part of what contributed to this was uh, the incessant wars and the incessant raids um, that were taking place uh, at the time, and began to move uh, towards prominent centers of learning, and were already moving toward scholasticism as early as Basil of Caesarea and the Cappadocian Fathers in the 4th century. Now, these scholastic communities were formed around these Christian centers and uh, gained ascendancy in uh, Europe, uh, eventually giving rise to the school of Canterbury developed by Theodore of Tarsus. And it appears that these centers of learning did not only teach theology um, and training for ministry, but very often also taught some of um, your music and uh, arithmetic and uh, all of the other things included uh, in the sciences, but very often uh, referred to the uh, theology as the queen of the sciences, the light that gives light to all other lights. The later Middle Ages were then characterized by circumstances significantly different from the periods that preceded it, and it's during this late Middle Ages that we begin to see the emergence of universities, very formal institutions um, of learning. And these institutions, um, while um, still giving um, uh, credence to, to bishops, were still required to ensure that theology is taught uh, within the, the context of, of the church. Now, while that was the case, Rodin concludes that much of these duties, even though there were requirements for bishops to make sure that theology is being taught, much of these duties were being taken up by universities. And apparently, scholasticism is said to have dominated the theological studies from a, a very early time. Needless to say, this resulted in unattainable and inaccessible standards for those wishing to be trained for ministry. Very often, like in the case of the Catechetical School of Alexandra, the medieval university aimed to produce mastery of a whole field of learning. And this unfortunately would lead to um, people studying for a period of 17 years, including not only disputation, but also lecturing. And it became less and less related to the work of the ministry and more and more the route to a life of academic scholarship. Now, I do not think that it is our intention if we are at all going to be engaged in missional praxis as theological institutions to keep students at theological institutions for 17 years. <laughs> it does not serve the mission. 
And we have needed to, while I was with my colleagues at Cape Town Baptist Seminary, rethink what our strategy was. We don't want to keep them, we want to release them as quickly as possible. And what does that require of our curriculum? I think it requires some serious admissions on our part. The admission that you cannot teach everything if you hope to see them planted in a church. If you hope to see them go, then I don't think you can keep them for as long as it takes to teach them everything they need to know. And so for the importance of that accountability relationship, I think there are broader partnerships that are required. There are serious admissions required for us as theological institutions about what it takes to participate in this mission. The Reformation brought about an emphasis on ad fontes, back to the sources for those preparing for ministry. And this development led to a more critical engagement with literature and an emphasis on historical grammatical interpretations as opposed to the allegorical readings that the popes were, uh, were keen to, to perpetuate. Now, with respect to my colleague, um, my learned colleague, um, I think that we have some literature that suggests that the reformers were slightly more missional than just off the bat saying they were not missional. I think they were living in very special times, times in which it could cost them their life doing the work that they were doing. And in fact, many people who came from the institutions such, such as Wittenberg, Geneva, um, Zurich, and the like, were going to these foreign mission fields at the peril of their own lives. And they were risking their lives in mission endeavor. And I think then when we refer to the reformers as and those engaged during this time of the Reformation as not missional, I think it's slightly disingenuous because we certainly don't have the same um, risk and the same threat to our lives. And so it's a little, um, I think, less than honest of an honest reflection of their role um, in theological institutions and being, and being missional. Now, modern times seem to have followed the trend of deferring to universities, resulting in alienation of the church, forcing, uh, you know, forcing ecclesiastical bodies to develop um, their own institutions and to pursue accreditation for themselves, because uh, what was busy happening in, um, in institutions of higher learning and universities tended to uh, alienate the church and uh, instead of being a servant of the body of Christ in, in, many, in many respects. What are some of the conclusions that I draw from this, from this brief, even though you feel like it might have been long, uh, this, br <laughs> <laughs> this brief history of theological education? I think... If we look at the history, we see theological education vacillating between um, emphases of being uh, tending toward more practical tuition and then towards more scholastic tuition. And uh, when it tended towards scholasticism, you saw the friaries come into effect. Um, and uh, when it tended toward too much, uh, practical um, uh, uh, ministry outcomes, um, then you saw a resistance toward that in, uh, in a return to the sources and being a little bit more critical as far as uh, dealing with, with literature is concerned. And so I think we see a vacillation between either predominantly practical or theoro uh, theoretical um, uh, emphases. <coughs> Excuse me.
At every extreme, such institutions alienated the church. Going to either extreme meant that you would alienate the church. And so I do not think it a matter of either or. I would argue, I believe, the church through history has rejected either extreme. And we would do Africa a disservice if we emphasize one without the other. It appears to me, if we look at the history of theological education, that the one is required as much as the other. Academic rigor is necessary as well as practical expertise and training and development. And whether it is possible to teach mission without doing mission is in and of itself questionable. Theological institutions are thus required if they are going to be successfully engaged in carrying across what mission is and what it is comprised of to actually participate in mission and to do mission themselves. So this then brings me to what some of the contemporary challenges are in the light um, of what has taken place um, historically in theological education. You will have noticed, as I suggested earlier, that there was this move away from this uh, very costly discipleship, this very costly and almost intrusive development of those leaders who would then disciple other leaders toward a more professionalized, toward a more, um, you know, removed or at a distance uh, tuition. And we find ourselves then at a impasse. Because while we see that there is this decreasing pool of resources and an ever-increasing need for training, the temptation is to defer to diversified models that do not facilitate costly discipleship. So it is then a matter of just providing the theoretical information that people need without necessarily delving into what is necessary for the holistic formation of people who would go on to disciple other persons. And so when we look at um, our models as institutions, we need to revisit whether or not such models are actually perpetuating um, this notion of of uh, a discipleship that only requires theoretical engagement or that only requires that you know certain things cognitively instead of that you get to see, that you get to practice, that you get to walk alongside someone who is actually living that out. And so as an institution, as a guiding principle then, we would like to see that contact in some way or the other is emphasized. And at Cape Town Baptist Seminary, while uh, Cape Town Baptist Seminary was one of the institutions that started delving into hybrid theological training, there was never a reduction in the emphasis that we value contact with the people that we are discipling. And so when we use diversified models, there's nothing I think that is wrong with that. I think it is useful for the theoretical components. But how do we facilitate some of the elements that can only be conveyed when they have contact with people who are walking with the Lord Jesus Christ and people who are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? And one of the ways in which that transpires is to make sure as much as is possible that as an institution you have contact with the church and that you make sure that those who are wishing to study with you also are embedded in the body of Christ, are embedded in the church. This is going to be essential for their holistic development. This is going to be essential for whether or not they are going to be discipled beyond only theoretical and, um, and cognitive prowess. So not only then do I think it's essential that we make sure that these students have contact, contact with the church, 
because it's questionable whether or not they can train and adequately prepare for ministry in the church if they do not have contact with that church or with the body of Christ. They must also have contact with their peers and they must have contact with their curators as well. And so that then has been one of the guiding principles that I would like to suggest is something that we need to consider seriously about diversified models is, does it actually rob such a student of uh, the privilege of walking alongside someone and seeing the intended uh, curriculum walked out? Now, this language of intentional and unintentional curriculum shouldn't be one that actually exists in theological institutions. I think everything should be intentional. The stuff that we know are rather caught than taught is something that we must intentionally plan for and intentionally build into our curriculum. And so when you have a curriculum review, are you only reviewing the curriculum from the standpoint of what the uh, theories are or what the uh, theoretical content, content is that uh, these students are going to be participating in? Or are you actually seriously talking and thinking about um, how you are going to facilitate contact and uh, ensure that we are in touch with these training for, for ministry? I think the mission is impaired. I think we cannot then do, um, or as theological institutions, do missions or teach missions if we don't, if we don't do missions um, in, in, in that way as well. Is everyone still okay? I'm not. Thank you. <laughs> Furthermore, I think I think there's a tendency to build what I regard as false dichotomies between and and Dr. Lawless mentioned this just a few moments ago between between what's the church's responsibility and what's the seminary's responsibility. We like to say that discipleship is the task of the church. Theological institutions are organs of that organism, the church. And when we are constantly debating whether or not this is something that belongs in our sphere or that sphere, what ends up happening is these individuals are not discipled. I think we are living um, with the false perception that those who come to theological institutions do not need to be discipled. If it is not discipleship that's taking place in that institution, why do you exist? Are you only facilitating discipleship, the mission, by extension? Or are you participating in it by discipling those that the church entrusts to us for training? As a consequence, this is going to have costly implications for theological institutions. The discipleship of those individuals entrusted to us is not a small task. It is a thankless job. It is one for which you are not likely to be rewarded equally to which you would be if you were teaching in a public institution. But you are discipling God's people. And the task of discipling means that they go on to disciple others. And so I'm nervous about saying this belongs to the church or this belongs to a theological seminary. I think, like I said earlier, that we must leave the lines blurred. I'm not persuaded that it's easy to come up with those clear distinctions about, sorry, you haven't met these criteria, X, Y, and Z, off you go back to the church until you can say that you have met those criteria. I'll give you a, a, a personal example. 
I came to seminary as a 17 year old student. 17 years old. Dr. Ronnie Davis, my Greek professor, I studied with that man sitting right to his left, my right, two decades ago. That's how long Dr. Ronnie Davis has been in theological training. <laughs> and Professor Godfrey Harold to his right. 17 year old, ignorant, absolutely arrogant. <laughs> I do have a witness. <sighs> utterly, utterly ignorant. I hadn't cut my teeth on church leadership. All I know is I was in school sharing the gospel with someone and, and they expressed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and it seemed to me as if though light had come into this person that I cannot describe and I realized I would not do anything else with my life. Gone with being a medical professional, gone with being an engineer, gone with putting bread on the table of my family, knowing that we're going hungry, I'm the eldest son in a poor family, I must provide for my household. But I came to seminary, I had never had a father figure. My father was a, an abusive, belligerent man. And I had seen my mother beaten to a pulp on numerous occasions. I knew nothing about being a man. Nothing about being a Christian man. I knew nothing about being in this world. Here's, one day we go to a camp. And a young lady who I had befriended comes with me to this camp at seminary. I'll get to some of the important critical stuff. But you need some of this background. Let me help you. <laughs> I go and sit at Dr. Ronnie Davis's table. Ronnie says to me, you should be sitting over there. She came here with you. How are you sitting here? I don't know if he remembers it, but this was for me one of the first examples where something as basic as courtesy, a guy befriending a young lady, Something as basic as that had to be taught to me by an American coming from who knows where. <laughs> Texas. Today, I'm having conversations with you about how theological institutions can be more missional. Only because God had given me the privilege of sitting with those guys. Contact. Contact. And it doesn't, and I know it's, it's difficult for theological institutions to replicate that contact with everyone. It's already costly with the few students that you do have, which is why I would like to suggest that there needs to be a tripartite of partnership that exists between theological institutions. First, theological institution with other theological institutions. And then those theological institutions with the body of Christ. Because that is where these people are going to be discipled. That is where these leaders who must disciple other leaders, this is where you can see them formed. Now, the thing about this discipleship that is so costly is because we seem to think that everyone who comes to us does not need to be discipled. They're coming for training for ministry. And yet, in order for them to be missional, someone needs to hold them accountable. Discipleship has as one of its key tenets accountability. And if all they are is someone receiving theoretical content at a distance, who is holding them accountable for now using that? And how are they proclaiming the gospel? And when are they proclaiming the gospel, if at all? Now, I must hurry. I've said quite a few things and much of that has been, has been some rambling and I'm, and I'm not sure that Dr. Blesso has any idea where I am. <laughs> <laughs> but let's think then of some of these praxis. 
I think as a core function of our business, for, for example, let's talk about that tripartite of, of, of partnership over here. How many institutions in this room have a partnership with another institution in this room? Please put your hands up. One, two, same institution? Different? Three, four? The sound you are hearing is the sound of African partnership. Some institutions over here think that you need to do this alone. Some institutions here think that you must pursue accreditation yourself. Really? If you want to be missional wherever you are, let me tell you right now that there are institutions in this room who are offering theological training that you can offer exactly where you are and see your individuals or, or those trained with you developed so that eventually they become the academics in your institution. For example, at the Mauritian Bible Training Institute, I'm engaging with Cape Town Baptist Seminary to enter into a a memorandum of understanding so that their curriculum is offered to those students. Why? Because the, the, the accreditation pathway in Mauritius requires that I offer a qualification in another, well, a qualification that's accredited in another jurisdiction for eight years before we can apply for accreditation ourselves in Mauritius. Do you think Mauritius can wait another eight years? Now, some institutions here want to do what will take 30 years to do, but if you just partnered with one another in what is tangible partnerships for whether it be administration, whether it be the delivery of your programs, etc., etc., you can do it in five. But you refuse. You want to, and I don't put the blame on you exclusively. I think some of you work for boards of directors that do not want such types of partnerships and maybe the conversation needs to be had with them as well. But I would think that that kind of partnership, those types of conversations would be utterly essential for making sure that we as theological institutions are missional and that we, that we further a missional praxis. So that interdependence, I think, is going to be in essential. Internationalization. I used to work in universities where internationalization was a big theme. In fact, I managed the International Student Services Office at the University of the Western Cape, a large-scale public institution in South Africa. And under my uh, responsibility were all of the international institutions, I mean, uh, international students uh, at, the, at the institution. Big budget went into making sure that the students of that institution were internationalized because we're living in a global world. And so we wanted to make sure that the benefits of globalization were extended to those students. And so what we did was we developed partnerships for the exchange, not just of lecturers, but the exchange of students going to live in a, another part of the world and spend a semester over there. How many, of that, how many of us are doing that in this room? I'll tell you now that on every internationalization exercise I have come from, I have seen a marked difference in the way that I work. I have seen development in myself as an individual. And if you are looking to develop your institution, it may be the most helpful thing for you to have an arrangement to see uh, lecturers and students from your institution take an exchange, a cultural exchange, or a, a semester away at a different institution. And I would not just say, um, uh, if I were king for a day, I'd say this is essential if you want to be missional. You want our students to go to the ends of the earth, 
but some of us have not even seen those places. Now, I, I say this because I think there are some real tangible benefits that come from seeing a lecturer developed from going to uh, from a school that uh, doesn't have much resources to a school that has much more resources and seeing how their administration works, seeing how they develop curriculum, seeing how they deliver curriculum, seeing all of those things and then after a while going back to your institution and starting to look at you, you will just see things differently. So internationalization exchanges, I think, are going to be essential for us doing those sorts of things. And then many colleagues have mentioned so many aspects of, uh, of, uh, of some of these praxis. For example, uh, Mission Week, something I've been exposed to at uh, Cape Town Baptist Seminary for the first time in, 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 in my life, um, when they sent me on mission to, to Paulsmore Prison in um, well, that wasn't the, the only time they've sent me on missions elsewhere. They didn't only send me to prison, um, but <laughs> <laughs> they sent me all over the show. But I was exposed to mission for the very first time at the theological institution that I was at. And our lecturers used to come with us to those uh, occasions. And senior students used to participate with junior students. And there's this transferal, there's this learning, there's this discipleship that's busy taking place. Um, irrespective um, of, of where you are doing it. So I don't think that I'm going to belabor the praxis any further except to suggest that if we as institutions want to be missional, I think that we need to start thinking seriously about the potential that exists for partnership and how those partnerships can help us develop missional praxis for us as institutions so that we don't only teach mission but also do mission. Thank you. I have suggested a few questions for us that you can uh, discuss at your tables. I think it requires a significant amount of introspection because what I want you to do is to ask yourself, how are you doing mission at your institution? Not just how are you teaching, the, you know, uh, delivering curriculum on mission, but what are you doing um, um, uh, as mission at your institution? And then what partnerships do you have that enable mission at uh, your theological institution? And what can you offer other institutions that enables mission. So can you put your hand up and say, we're happy to receive you. Uh, obviously, a memorandum of understanding is things that need to be discussed. These things are costly. I'm not saying they are not, um, but I do regard them as, as essential conversations that need to be had if we as African theological institutions um, uh, want to be more missional in our outlook. Thank you. <clears throat>